Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Today, I want to start a series which may end up with a lot of messages and it may end today. I'm not really sure. But I want to discover, unlock, reveal the mysteries of the universe. As Christians, many times we are considered ignorant. We are, or as they say here in the Ozarks, ignorant. Okay. But we are considered to be, many times, Christians just don't have an understanding. They go to science class and they hear about the universe being created in the Big Bang and all of that. And then they come to church and they hear that Earth was created in six 24-hour periods. Then they go back to school and their teacher says, well, that's impossible. It just can't happen that way. Something must be wrong with your teaching at church. And so kids grow up thinking, well, church is where people just don't have a clue. And the real world out there, the universities, the science worlds, they have the answers. Well, let me tell you something. I have been on archaeological digs. I've been all over the world. I have friends who are scientists. Uh, Loretta's grandfather was uh, an engineer on the Apollo 8 program, and several times we went down to NASA in Huntsville, Alabama, walked through with him, and, and he showed us parts of the, the space capsules that he worked on. So uh, we, we are not ignorant of science, but I would like to take some of these mysteries of science, some of these things that everybody wonders about but they don't want to talk about and kind of go through them here's one thing I've discovered every time that there is a scientific discovery it proves the Bible instead of disproving the Bible the problem is is most people don't know how to rightly divide the word you can take for example uh, looking up a, a document this week and how big is the universe? Well, the reality is nobody knows because the universe is continually expanding. And what they thought was the universe a few hundred years ago was just basically the earth and the moon and a, and a sun that was rotating around us. And then they discovered that no, the earth is rotating around the sun. And so then they discovered the solar system. Then they discovered that Oh my goodness, our sun is actually rotating around some other area and we have a Milky Way. And then they discovered that our sun is just one of, now listen to me, one of hundreds of billions. Now let that soak in for a moment. Our sun is but one of hundreds of billions of suns in the Milky Way. And so, when I was in high school, the Milky Way is the biggest thing out there. Wow, hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way. But see, now we know that there are literally hundreds of billions of galaxies, which the Milky Way is one galaxy, and there are literally hundreds of billions of galaxies. And when they put the Hubble telescope out there, which is not the biggest right now, by the way, floating in space, but when they put the Hubble telescope out there, they found out that a lot of these stars in distant reaches of the universe weren't really stars. They were actually galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars within them. So we are looking at something now where the Bible says, and God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1. God created the heavens and the earth. 
But over the years, there's been so much misinterpretation of the Bible. Did you know that sometimes the Bible says things that you read over all the time that you don't really realize it's what it says? Let's just take a look at, uh, and I gave the video department four pages or five, six pages of scriptures. And the one I'm getting ready to tell them isn't on the list. But let's just take a look at Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1. I think they can probably find that one. It's back at the beginning. And let's take a look at the New King James Version if we have a choice here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's Barashit bara Elohim et Hashemayim, Hashemayim, which is plural. That's the word for heavens. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right? Now, is this on day one? Trick question. Is this on day one? No, day one, day one hasn't got here yet. Are you following me? Day one has not got here yet. Let's take a look at verse two. All right. You got your Bibles? And the earth was without form and void. That phrase, without form and void, is tohu vabohu, two words in the Hebrew language. And that means the earth became formless and void. Now, I could give you a lot of scriptures that tell us that when God created the heavens and the earth, He created them perfect. He did not create them in a state of chaos. And that's what Tohu vabohu means. It means it became, it became formless and void. It became chaotic. Did that happen on the first day? <clears throat> no, no, we, we haven't got to the first day yet. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God, oh my goodness, we haven't even got to the first day, and the Spirit of God shows up. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Let's take a look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now in the Hebrew, if you take a look at this, He didn't say, let there be light. Because that sounds like God shows up and He says, come on light, show up. No, it actually in its most pure, simple term is light be, or light is, or... I'm here. Because it doesn't say that the sun and the moon were created yet. Right? They didn't get created till day four. So God is showing up in the midst of all of this chaos. Now what caused this chaos? What event could have happened in the heavens that caused chaos on the earth after God had created the earth perfect. Now, Jesus said, and I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning to the earth. When did this happen? It happened way back before Adam and Eve. So there was a rebellion in heaven. And God showed up and He said, Here I am. I'm going to straighten this mess out. Was this day one? Let me ask you something. Was light created at this point in time? No. God did not create light on day one. God showed up on day one. Now, what in the world would make us think that God is light? Well, let's take a look at what John said. 1 John 1.5 This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. 
Now, Thursday night in the message, for those of you who were here and those of you who were watching by way of being online or whatever, we were taught that Jesus is the Word, right? And that we are to become one with the Word. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father and I are one. So the Father, Jesus, and the Word are one. Because if A equals B and A equals C, then B and C are the same. Are you following me? Now let's take a look at John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word. Now, we had a lesson Thursday night about how we are to become one with the Word, right? Now, now follow me on this. In the beginning was the Word. What else happened in the beginning? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God hovered over the, the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3. All things were made through him. Now wait a minute. I thought in the beginning God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Well, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. So if God created it, Jesus created it. Are you following me? All things were made by him and without him. Now that's referring to the word. Without him, the word, nothing was made that was made. Wow. Look at verse 4. In him was life. And the life, <clears throat> now, now look at this close, was the what? The light of men. Verse 5. And the light, what did we discover a few moments ago? God is light. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That word comprehend can also mean overpower. In other words, nothing is going to overpower the light. Light is, in the natural, is the one constant in our universe. Now let me give you some figures here. How, ma how many meters per second does light travel? How many meters per second? 299,792,458 meters per second. That is uh, approximately 186,282 miles per hour, per, per second, excuse me, per second. Pretty fast. Pretty fast. Now, that's in a vacuum. That's in a vacuum. Have you ever heard the, the phrase, the vacuum of space? Oh, this is interesting. At the rate light is traveling at 299 million meters per second, it has taken the light at the far end of the galaxy, as far as we can see, with our best telescopes in outer space. It has taken 46 billion years for that light to reach here. The galaxy right now, now the universe, the known universe that our scientists, the best scientists at NASA, and this is increasing by a few points every single day, but right now is 
I believe it's 96 billion light years across. Now, our universe is expanding. The universe we are in is expanding. And science tells us that it expanded from a point that is smaller than the point on a needle, that the entire universe was inside this little teeny tiny point on the end of a needle, that small. And there was, and we heard about it, and we used to laugh about it, but they've pretty well proven it now, a Big Bang. And when this Big Bang happened, it was, we'll round it off, 13.8 billion years ago. Now here's the thing. Light traveling at 299 million meters per second, the light you are seeing when you see that star through the Hubble telescope that is 40-some billion light years away, when you are seeing that light, you are actually seeing that star 46 billion years ago. Because you're seeing the light. No, no. Oh, this gets, this gets fun. This will give you brain cramps if you just think about it long enough. You, you are seeing that star as it was, not as it is, because the light that's leaving it right now is not going to get here for another 40-some billion years. So you're seeing that star, you're seeing the light that left it 40-some billion years ago. So there is a connection between light and time because you're actually looking back in time that far. It's like you're seeing a picture that was taken all those years ago. Now keep in mind, God created this kind of light which is a natural light. But he is, he is a spiritual light that goes way beyond that. And for all we know, this universe may just be one of 100,000 billion universes. We don't know. Because when you ask them how big it is, they don't know. Because it's they get a telescope that goes farther, and they just see more. Well, how does that line up with the Word of God? Because some creationists say everything was created in six 24-hour periods. That on the first day, God created the heavens and the earth. But if you look at the Scripture like we did a few moments ago, you find out that wasn't on the first day, and it doesn't tell us how much time passed. Somebody may say, well, what about the dinosaurs? What about all these bones of all these ancient civilizations? Well, if you read the Scriptures, you'll find that Lucifer, Lucifer was involved with all those ancient situations. Ezekiel 28 and several other places tell us. And that's part of the reason he was cast out of heaven was not only because he decided he was going to, like it says in Isaiah, put his throne on the sides of the north and be like God. It wasn't just because of that. It was because he was not fair in his trading with the kings in the commerce on the earth. And the Bible says that when he was cast down to the earth, now follow me on this. The Bible says when he was cast down to the earth, that the kings of the earth sneered at him. There were nations. If you have nations, you have boundaries. If you have kings, you've got currency. You've got borders. You've got armies. There, were, there was a tremendous, and we don't know how big it was, civilizations on this earth. And who told you dinosaurs were dumb anyway? You've been watching too much Flintstones. Now, let's take a look at some scriptures here. John 8, 12. Jesus said, 
I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, let me ask you something. Is there a battle going on between light and darkness? There is. And everything in the kingdom of God is referred to as light. We are, I can show you scriptures, we are children of the light. And we are expected to overcome, overpower, conquer, rule above darkness. When there is darkness, that means you can't see what's going on. But when there is light, that means things are revealed. Our God is the God who reveals things to us. The Bible tells us that if we will walk in the light and we will allow the Holy Spirit to rule in us, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. Well, how is he going to show us things to come? Because we're not walking blindly in the dark. We are children of the light, and you can see what's coming ahead. Wouldn't it have been nice that if 20 years ago, you would have had your eyes open. Dub in some applause there. They always say hindsight's twenty twenty. Well, you can have twenty twenty forward sight too, if you'll be led by the Holy Spirit. And if we could go to the New King James Version on the monitors, that would really be nice. John twelve forty six. There we go. John 12, 46, Jesus said, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Isn't that good? God is light. Now, what do you do if somebody comes up to you and says, well, you're a Christian, how do you explain the fact that there was a big bang 13.8 13, 8, 13 billion years ago? Actually, you could say, well, I wasn't there. But it could be true. And why could it be true? Because it doesn't contradict the Word of God. What if somebody comes up to you and says, now as a Christian, you say that Adam came out of the garden Adam came out of the garden 4,000 years before Jesus was born. Well, how do you explain all the bones on the earth? And how do you explain? You say, well, it doesn't contradict my theology. I believe the Bible. I believe Adam came out of the garden 4,000 years before Jesus, 6,000 years before me. But the Bible doesn't tell us how long he was in the garden. And the Bible doesn't tell us everything that happened when the earth became formless and void and how long it was not formless and void and there were civilizations on the earth. It doesn't tell us that. Why? It's irrelevant to your salvation. The purpose of the Bible is to tell us what we need to know. Now, somebody may say, well, why didn't the Bible just tell you everything? Let me, let me, let me give you a clue. Have you ever heard people say, they don't have a clue? I'm going to give you one. Here's a clue. It is impossible. Now, now listen to this. It is impossible for there to be a book ever written that reveals all of history. It is impossible. Why? Why? Because there never was a beginning of history. There was a beginning of what we know. But the same God who is taking us into eternity future, He has lived in eternity past. And eternity past has no beginning. Our book starts out and says, in the beginning, in the beginning of what we need to know. 13.8 billion years ago, if there was a Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, 
I heard a guy on the Science Channel the other day. Somebody said, well, what was there before... What was there before 13.8? What if you went back 13.9 billion years? What was there? We don't have a clue. They don't know. I'll tell you somebody that does know is God. Because God was there. The reality is 13.8 billion years ago to God would be less than like a grain of sand on this coastline of California. This is why the Scripture says there will be a time when there will be time no more. Because time, today we're talking about light, and I plan to talk about time as one of the mysteries of the universe before long. But time was created for us. In this framework of eternity, time was created for us to live in. And there was a time when time began for us, and there will be a time when time will end. And we talk about these dispensations of time. Yes, we are on the earth in several dispensations of time. But there were countless, countless, literally countless, not just a whole bunch, countless dispensations of time before us. Have you ever stopped to think that if you could go back a trillion years, that God would be there doing something? If you could go back 120 billion trillion years to the tenth power, that'll take you off the charts. God's still there. Oh, what about the angels? No, there was a day when the angels were created. The Bible talks about Lucifer. And God says, you were perfect on the day you were created. See? Just like the earth. The earth was perfect on the day it was created. Lucifer was perfect on the day he was created. God didn't create the devil and he didn't create a messed up earth. He created a perfect being called Lucifer who was beautiful. And he created a beautiful earth. And Lucifer was doing stuff on the earth, and then he decided he was going to be like God, and he messed up really bad, and the earth became tohu vabohu, became corrupted, became formless and void. Then God steps up on the scene and says, hey, I'm here, and he's light. And it's kind of like he took the, the hard drive that was just completely messed up, and he reformatted it. Just reformatted the earth. And said, so, okay, now, we're starting over. So then he puts man in the garden, creates man in his likeness and in his image. And as it says in Psalms, one of the angels said, Ooh, what are you doing here? Who is this man? Why are you thinking about him all the time? It surprised the angels. God is light. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, 105. One of my favorite scriptures. In the beginning, now, now just while this is up there, listen to this. Remember we read in John chapter 1 a few moments ago. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything that was made was made through Him. And He was the light Remember, it says that. And then you go down to verse, uh, you drop down in, later in that chapter, and it says, and the Word became flesh. It's talking about Jesus, and the Word became flesh. Now, look at this Scripture, and just think of this prophetically. Your Word is a lamp to my feet. And what? A light. The writer of this psalm, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned these words for a song that the Jews sang, that the Hebrews sang back in the day, and they would sing this. You know, the book of Psalms is a whole bunch of psalms. And this is a part of one of the psalms. That just means it's a song. It's a song they sang. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. God is light. 
And we need to understand that as much as science understands the universe, science is dealing with natural light. But God inside of us, we are dealing with a spiritual light that supersedes the natural light. Wow. I love it. Okay. Now, in Matthew 5.14, Jesus makes a statement when he's talking to his disciples. In Matthew 5.14, he's telling them, you are the light of the world. Now, this is where we need to really step it up and understand something. If the world is going to change, they're going to change because they see the light. Okay? They're going to change because they see the light. But how are they going to see the light? They're going to see it in you. Why? Because as a believer and follower of Jesus, you are the light of the world. Jesus said that. Don't, don't be looking at me with that look. Jesus said it. I wasn't looking at anybody when I said things about that look. Don't be going home and saying, he was talking about my face. No, I wasn't talking about your face. I talked about Amos. Okay. I love Amos. Yeah, great Bible study on Friday night. Great Bible study. You guys need to go to that. Or watch it online like I do. It's good. It's good. See, I can go to his Bible study in, in my house pajamas. Okay. Don't be thinking about that. You are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden. Wow. Well, take a look. Drop down two more verses at verse 16. Matthew 5, 16. We're told what to do with that light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father that's in heaven. What's going to happen when people see the light in you? Then... See, the light that's in you, we're not talking about light that travels at 299 million meters per second. We're talking about spiritual light. And when they see that light in you, what's going to happen? They're going to glorify the Father. Because He is the source. Hmm. You know, when Jesus was born, priest under the anointing of the Holy Spirit made a proclamation in Luke chapter 2, verse 32. And I could tell you the whole story, but we won't get into that for now. But I'm just going to tell you what he said. He said, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The priest over Jesus in the temple said he was going to be a light to the Gentiles and bring glory to Israel. Huh. Well, let's go back to John 1.5. John 1.5. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. That word could comprehend could also be, uh, without giving you a Greek lesson, that could also be translated overpower. The darkness did not overpower it. When you let your light shine before men, your light will not be overpowered. I said your light will not be overpowered. And the words you speak will affect the light that is shining from you. I uh, I have a confession to make. I don't like to make confessions, as most people don't, but I think it's good for the soul. I have said for years, every single time I go to Walmart, I get the employee that's cashing three back checks and has 22 coupons and buying all the specials as the one person in front of me. Or... It's the person 
who has bought all those clothes back there off the sale rack and the tags are missing off of half of them and every time they look at one, they got to call somebody to go back and get the price. Or I get the guy that hasn't bathed in about three months and uh, I, I, I can't even say what I'm picturing right now. And I've said that. And every time I go to Walmart, I'll call Loretta up. True. I say, Loretta, I've been in line here for about 10 minutes. It only took me two minutes to get what I wanted. But I'm in line here. And this lady's trying to cash a check from Afghanistan. And they can't quite get a hold of the bank over there. And they got three supervisors on it. And Oh, no. They're switching cashiers. Now they're changing. It, you know, and I would go through it. True? I mean, and I would say it only takes me, you know, two or three minutes to do my shopping, but it's like Hotel California. You know, you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. I'm telling you, it's just, it's just. <laughs> and then I'm at Walmart a couple, three days ago, and I'm getting something. And it happens again. Well, I went to a different Walmart. I thought maybe it wouldn't happen at that Walmart. <laughs> and <laughs> I did. <laughs> no, I am not going to the self checkout. If I wanted to go to the self-checkout, I'd just order online. Let them deliver it to my house. I can stay in my TV pajamas. So I call Loretta, and I say, I'm going to be late getting home. Partially because I drove 10 miles to a different Walmart, but they followed me. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it hit. It was my confession. I have been saying, every time I go to Walmart, this happens. And the devil's going, yes, I got permission. <laughs> and then he calls out all the people who are those people, and he tells them which lane to get in. But I changed my confession I am the fastest in and the fastest out at Walmart. And you know what? It worked. I, I went there, day, was it day before yesterday? I went there and I got in there and I had my stuff and I walk over there to the past the self-checkout place and, and I looked and there was a, a cashier standing at the end of the row. I said, are, are you on duty? Yes, sir. Thank you, Jesus. It works. It works. You know. So if we want to walk in the light, part of walking in the light is getting our words in alignment with words of light and quit speaking words of darkness. I had been speaking words of darkness so long that I had become expectant. It's kind of like people... Uh, he was a good man. I met with him this week, but there's a guy from way over in Kansas someplace said, I was reading your Hope book and I got to page 35. And I need to talk to you. He drove all the way. He made an appointment for only had 30 minutes that whole day free. He drove all the way from someplace over in the far side of Kansas to get over here to meet with me for 30 minutes to talk about page 35 and finding hope when things look hopeless. And I looked at that page. And you know, that's an interesting page. Because it says on that page that sometimes a person can be hopeless for so long in a certain area that that hopelessness becomes a way of life. And you never expect anything else to happen. You live in that hopelessness thinking that that's normal. But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the dark. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the dark. I'm giving you good news today. There is light. And you can walk in the light. 
But it's going to take you changing something. You know the old phrase, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll continue to have what you've always had. Let me, let me tell you another one. If you keep saying what you've always said, you'll continue to see what you've always seen that you've proclaimed through the prophecy of what you've spoken. Many people are prophesying darkness into their life. We need to change. We need to be the light of the world. We need to let the world see the light of God in us, and they're not going to do it as long as our mouth keeps speaking darkness. All right? So, <laughs> 2 Corinthians 6.14. Now, here's, here's, here's a, a principle. It's in the Bible. Light cannot fellowship with darkness. Second Corinthians six fourteen. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I'm not saying don't have unbelievers as a friend. I'm not saying quit a job because there's an unbeliever that works there. I'm not saying if somebody you know has a swastika on their arm, you know that you're supposed to go up and shoot them or anything. That's not what I'm talking about. But I am saying this, you don't make your inner circle. You know who I'm talking You know, you've got an inner circle. Everybody has one. You may not think you do, but you think about it. You have an inner circle. You've got people you trust. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Remember that scripture that says, Ephesians 5, 1, that we're to be imitators of God? Well, let me tell you what. What are we supposed to imitate? The Scripture we read earlier. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. You are the light of the world, and there shouldn't be any darkness inside of you. When the Mueller report comes back on you, you should be vindicated. <laughs> now, Let's kind of put a bow on this. Uh, Ephesians 5.8. Ephesians 5.8. For you were once darkness. Doesn't say you were once in darkness. No. There was a time when you were not a believer. And you were dark. Are you following me? For you were once darkness. But now. Say but now. But now. You are light in the Lord. So, suck it up, Bubba. Walk as light. <laughs> Just, well, how do I do that? Just do it. Okay. 1 John. Chapter 1, we're going to read something again, but I'm going to read an extra verse. This is the message, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Hmm. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That should at least get a whoo-hoo. <laughs> That's good news. Now, here's how we're going to wrap this up. We're going to skip all those pages of Scriptures that I gave them back there. And I'm going to tell you this. There will be a day when the Lord's going to appear in the sky and the church is going to be caught away. Seven years is going to pass. We're going to be in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb and at the judgment seat of Christ. On earth, the Antichrist is going to have all hell break loose on earth. It's going to be a horrible thing. Two, three and a half year periods of 1260 days and 42 months each right here on the earth. The Bible talks a lot about that in the book of Revelation. Then at the end of the seven years, Jesus is coming back with us. We're coming back with Him. And He is going to bind the devil for a thousand years and Jesus is going to set up His kingdom. 
At the end of the thousand years, there's going to be, Satan's going to be released and there's going to be a revolt. Once again, God's going to put, put down the rebellion and that's when we have the great white throne judgment. Then, the Bible tells us, as we move into eternity, that there is a new heaven, a new earth. So this earth is going to be, and that word for new, there's uh, the Greek word that means refurbished. It's going to be refurbished. In other words, uh, after the rebellion and everything, it may be a little bit of tohu va bohu, but, but God's going to clean it all up. It's going to be refurbished. And then there will be a new Jerusalem coming down. And this is where Jesus went to prepare a place for us. When he said he was going to go and prepare a place for us in John 14, this is where he's talking about. So there is a new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven, 20,000 furlong square, that's approximately 1,500 miles square, comes down out of heaven. Now here's the deal. In the heavenly Jerusalem that's there now, there is a temple. And in the temple, there is a Holy of Holies and there's an Ark of the Covenant. And that's the Ark of the Covenant that Jesus put His blood on on the day He was resurrected. But in this new temple that's going to be, or excuse me, in this new Jerusalem that's going to be coming down at the end of the millennium, there will be no temple. And the Scripture says that there'll neither be Reason for us to have a sun or a moon. Because the Lamb of God is going to be the light. He's going to be the light that illuminates everything. So we need to understand that this whole business of light, what the world knows about light, is just the physical light. But we have a revelation of the spiritual light that goes way beyond anything that natural science can understand. The only way that they can understand it is if they become a part of the light too. So live your life, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then what's going to happen? Everything's going to be fine. Because light always overpowers darkness. Now, how do I get this light inside of me? According to the Bible, in order to be a part of the church, and I'm not talking about this church building, I'm talking about the body of Christ, how to become a part of the church, is real simple. Jesus has already paid the price. He has already shed His blood, put it on the altar. Everything's done that needs to be done. We are in the position right now, at this point in time, in this dispensation of time, we are at a place where it's so easy to move into the kingdom of God. All we have to do is just believe in Jesus. And as Mark said so eloquently earlier, it's like the guy going across the uh, Niagara Falls on a tightrope with a wheelbarrow. We've we got to believe to the point where we're believing enough to get in that wheelbarrow. And we say, I believe in Jesus. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you believe that God raised Him from the dead, and you confess it, see, there, there you go, there's those words again, words are connected, and you confess it, you're saved. You say, well, it can't be that simple. Hello, God made it simple. I remind you, He's not walking around with a clipboard trying to figure out ways. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, I saw Ryan do that. Well, that, that excludes him. He can't get into heaven. Yeah. Oh, Nancy. Oh, man. I saw her the other day. She didn't cuss, but she looked like she wanted to. Well, that keeps her out. That keeps her out. God, God's not walking around with a clipboard trying to find things wrong or excuses to keep you out of heaven. He has done everything that needs to be done. If anything... He's looking for excuses to get you into heaven. He has done it all. All you have to do. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sounds too simple? Ah, that's just the way it sounds. But it is very basic. 
So, before we close this morning, I want you to examine your hearts. You know, back in the old Baptist days when I was pastor of the Southern Baptist Church, we would say, with every head bowed and every eye closed. No, we're not going to do it that way. With every head up and everybody looking around. Is there anybody? You want to make sure? Look, you can say, well, I don't know if I'm saved or not. You know if you're saved or not. I mean, look at, look at Amos and Rome over there. Look at them. If I went up to Amos and said, Amos, are you married? He goes, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> if you're married, trust me, you know it. You know it. If you're saved, you have that peace. You know it. You know it. So if you're not sure, if Amos would go, well, I'm not sure. Well, he's probably not. Right? Right, Roma? <laughs> Roma straighten him out. He'll find out real quick if he's married or not. <laughs> but look, if you don't know if you're saved or not, you may be watching online. And you don't know if you're saved or not. You may be watching a YouTube video six months from when this is live. There's no time or space in the kingdom of God. If you don't know if you're born again or not, you're probably not. Because if you're born again, you know it. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to make that confession right now. And here's the thing. Mean it in your heart. You may have said, well, I've gone to church and said that before. But did you mean it in your heart? Did you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth? So that's what we're going to do right now. If you're not sure, we're going to make sure. All right? So, dear Heavenly Father, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior right now. I believe that Jesus, your Son, died for my sins. I believe that Jesus, your Son, was resurrected by you. I repent of my sins. I will never deny Jesus. In other words, I'll never deny that I'm a Christian. Thank you for saving me. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Now turn to somebody and say, I'm saved, I'm born again. Now turn to somebody else and say, I'm saved and I'm born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Now stand up. We're going to make one last confession. God is light. And on this earth, I will reflect His glory. I will be the light of the world like He asked me to be. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray the blessing upon this great congregation of people. Father, I thank You that all of those who are watching online, around the world, whatever country they're in, Father, that You speak to them by Your Holy Spirit. I call forth the blessing of Your Word upon them. And that the light of Your Word shine upon them. Protect them today. Bless them today. In the name of Your Son, Jesus. Amen.